Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this ICAST webinar. I hope you're all well. And it's a pleasure to bring you this session today on the pitfalls of payroll. This series of webinars gives members an opportunity to find out about topical matters and to ask questions from both in-house experts at ICAST and external speakers. For those of you who don't already know me, I'm Justine Ricomini. I head up anything to do with Scottish and devolved taxes and employment taxation matters here at ICAS, as well as our monthly publication, CA Tax, and I'm going to be chairing this webinar today. So let me begin by setting out the disclaimer and inform you that this webinar provides general commentary on the topics under discussion. We expect our members to use their professional judgment and seek appropriate professional or legal advice when dealing with any matter discussed in this webinar today. So today's talk is about all things payroll. So let me waste no more time and tell you who is delivering the webinar. You'll see that this morning I'm delighted to be joined by Laura Murphy, who is the CIPP's Editor-in-Chief of the Payroll Profession's flagship magazine, Professional in Payroll, Pensions and Reward. Laura has also worked in payroll herself, and she began her career at the CIPP in the CIPP's policy team. So before I hand over to Laura, I must mention a couple of housekeeping matters. You can submit questions at any time through the Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the bottom of your screen. Only the presenters can see the questions. We will not be identifying anyone by name if you submit a question, so please don't be shy. Get your thinking caps on. We'll aim to answer as many questions as we can in the Q&A slot at the end. If we don't get to answer all your questions, we will put all the queries on a spreadsheet in the usual way and provide responses. This will be published together with the webinar on icast.com slash webinars. We're recording this webinar and we will make it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or indeed share it with other people. Everyone on the webinar is automatically muted, so there is no need to be concerned about background noise wherever you are. So, Laura, over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you for that introduction, Justine. I'm delighted to be joining today to talk to you about all things payroll. So, as Justine said, I'm from the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals. Um, now, just to make you aware of what we do at the Institute, we're responsible for keeping payroll professionals up to date with ever-changing guidance and legislation. Um, and it is really is ever-changing, which is one of the things we will discuss later today. Um, we also act as the voice of our members and also the wider payroll industry to speak to government departments about what might be working well um, in the payroll sphere and, of course, what isn't working so well. Um, we'll also feed into um, proposed policies that could impact payroll um, and again, act as that voice of members and the wider profession. So today we're going to talk payroll. Um, so I thought I'd kick off with just talking about how important the payroll industry is and how important it is as a department within the wider organisation. So if you think about it, every organisation pays its staff. 
and it is often the business's largest expenditure. So this is why I get confused sometimes when payroll is referred to as a back office function and people think that we just push that elusive big red button each payday. This leads me nicely into the second point, which is, if we're being brutally honest, people go to work to get paid, don't they? I mean, there, are, there is job satisfaction and things like that, but at the end of the day, we go to work to get paid, and this impacts the rest of our lives, really. So we get paid, and we pay our mortgage, we pay for childcare, we pay for food. So you can quickly see where there are issues with pay. This has a real impact on, on how staff feel. And that can actually decrease staff retention rates and impact morale. Um, we also need to be mindful of the fact that where there is an issue with pay, it won't be payroll that go and speak to the employee's mortgage provider, for example. It will be the employee's responsibility. And this can actually take them away from their day-to-day -day tasks. Because instead of focusing on work, they're, they're going to make phone calls to explain what's happened. Um, or if they are continuing work, they might not be as engaged because they'll be worrying about the situation with their pay. Now, I'm going to be honest, we've all had it where we've received our pay slip, we've looked and we're not picking up quite what we expected. It is that really horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. So this is why it's so important for payroll to be right first time, because it's so emotive and it does have that domino and knock on effect on the rest of other people's lives. So I'm reluctant to talk about the pandemic um, as it was such a horrible period in our lives. But one of the things that happened during that time was that payroll professionals were deemed key workers. Now, this was due to the fact that payroll professionals were still working to get people paid. And of course, we had the coronavirus job retention scheme and furlough. Now, during this time, payroll professionals were still expected to meet their, their remit of paying people accurately and on time. But they also had to deal with the nuances of the CGRS. I remember at one point, the guidance was changing literally daily. So payroll professionals had to keep on top of this as well as their BAU. Um, I think during this time as well, payroll um, as an industry really proved its worth. Um, and we'll come on to that a little bit later on. Um, there were also hundreds of pieces of legislation which govern the work of payroll professionals. I don't think people outside of the payroll department necessarily understand that. Um, and we'll talk about that again a little bit later on. But for example, national minimum wage it's not just as simple as ensuring somebody's paid a rate. There are sort of technical nuances around that as well. Um, payroll holds a wealth of amazing data. As I said, it's often the business's largest expenditure. Um, so it'll hold a lot of financial information. Um, and this can actually drive financial and strategic planning. Now, payroll are, are well placed to help with short, medium, long term budget goals that could really help the wider organisation. They'll be privy to things such as the tax freeze that we had announced until 2028, so how that could impact the business in the future. Um, and payroll also understand the true cost of employing someone, so obviously it's not just their salary, there are all those things that go alongside it, such as employers' national insurance, um, and obviously national insurance fluctuated wildly this year, um, employers' pensions and the cost of offering benefits. So payroll know all about these sorts of things and could really link in with finance to help that planning um, area. Payroll also holds lots and lots of data, so they need to be up to date with GDPR, um, so it might be worth speaking to the payroll department about that. Um, this is particularly pertinent because I know we've just had um, Cyber Scotland, the Cyber Security Week, from the 27th of Feb to the 5th of March. Um, I'm sure there have been some high cast campaigns about compliance with GDPR regulations, so again that's just another area that payroll are um, well versed in. So hopefully you now think payroll is amazing and understand how important it is. So now I wanna come on to some common areas of error and all of these slides sort of link back into one another. So the top one here is national minimum wage. And I, for one, am certainly hearing more and more about compliance with NMW um, and ensuring the right things are done. There have actually been some really high profile cases. So I'm sure you're all aware of the supermarket Iceland. Um, there was a really, really big case regarding Iceland and NMW. And what had happened was they'd um, allowed their employees to put into a Christmas saving scheme to put a bit of money away to you know, buy presents for friends and family, to buy a turkey, all those additional expenditures that come at Christmas. Now, Iceland obviously thought they were doing something nice for their employees to help their employees. 
but because of the way it was managed, it actually meant that they were breaching NMW regulations. Because the um, savings were deemed to be for the employer's own use and benefit, this reduced pay below NMW. And I believe the associated fines came up to £21 million. Now, obviously, that's a lot of money at any time. But given the current economic turbulence and cost of living crisis we're seeing, which is also impacting employers, nobody wants a fine, um, certainly not of that amount. Um, and we will actually come to another case later on um, in which national minimum wage breaches actually meant that a business had to close. So you quickly begin to see just how important it is to make sure that payroll is done correctly. Um, another area we've seen lots of movement in recently is holiday entitlement and pay. Um, when we as the CIPP go out and do presentations, it's often something that we're asked questions on. And that is because there seems to be ever-changing case law. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the Harper Trust versus Brazil case. Um, that went to the Supreme Court and that looked at the way um, holiday was paid to part year workers. Um, off the back of that, it's actually been found that there is a bit of disparity between part year and part time workers. So a consultation has been released to address that. So again, there's potentially further movement in that space. Um, the consultation has been put out by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, which has recently been disbanded um, and four new departments formed. Um, we're not sure who the remit for that's going to sit with, but it's certainly something to keep your eyes on going forward. And there was also a recent case, very recent, I think I read about it only last week, um, which regarded 49 medical couriers. And this looked at allowing them to pursue their claim for unlimited backdated holiday pay. Now, obviously, unlimited, um, this could have massive repercussions um, and it could also have um, greater implications for the gig economy if these couriers are deemed as workers. So holiday entitlement and pay, ever-changing, and again, I think when people don't necessarily work in payroll, they don't realise that employment law and cases such as this have a really big impact on the work that payroll carries out. Um, so when you are working in the payroll department, it's just a note to keep your eye out for these sorts of things and to ensure you're up to date with the latest. Now, I've popped another couple of things on here which might sound very common sense. So things like missed pay dates and missed overtime. Um, these are areas that we often see um, errors in and as we spoke about before, for the employee missing a pay date, that could have massive ramifications for them. Um, so we, we need to ensure that we're meeting payroll's core remit of paying people accurately and on time. Things like missed overtime, um, this is something that is a common complaint within organisations that somebody hasn't been paid their overtime. Um, and I know particularly at the moment, given the cost of living crisis, more and more people are picking up those extra hours to help them cope through this economic turbulence. So now it's it maybe even more pertinent than ever to make sure people's payroll is processed correctly and processed correctly first time. Um, redundancy payments, we actually have an advisory service at the CIPP where people can ring in or email in with their payroll related queries. And redundancy payments is always um, a big area of discussion. Um, there's obviously the statutory requirement, but then also organisations may offer um, a contractual amount. And it's making sure that you adhere to that to ensure that you don't end up in a, in a tribunal situation or in a situation where an employee is unhappy. Um, with redundancy payments as well, obviously that's the last payment an employee will receive. So it's really important to get that right to maintain that relationship. You don't want the employee to leave the business with a bad taste in their mouth um, because they could potentially go and badmouth the company. Um, and it may also mean that if they leave um, with their pay correct, they feel positively towards the company. So they may even return at a later date. Um, so yeah, just some common areas of error there. Obviously, that's not an exhaustive list. There are hundreds and hundreds of elements of payroll that need to be considered. But I'm conscious we only have an hour this morning. Um, so I thought I'd select a, a couple of the top few. So we've talked about what the errors can be. Now, I, I think this bit is crucial. What are the consequences of those errors? So obviously something that I've touched upon throughout this morning's session is the emotive impact on the employee. Um, so where there's an error, obviously that impacts the people that are working for the company, but there are other things to consider. So substantial fines, 
Now, I know I spoke about the Iceland case with NMW earlier. I mean, Iceland are a massive company, but this can happen regardless of organisation size. And this is actually quite a sad story, and it's local. Um, CIPP is based in Solihull, and I believe the nursery in question um, that I'm going to talk about is also based in Solihull. So the nursery allowed some of its staff to um, allow their own children to use the nursery facilities um, and to use it for their childcare. Now, because the deduction for that childcare was taken prior to the payment being made to the employees, this actually breached NMW regulations. And when there was an audit um, from HMRC, they identified this and the associated um, back payments, fines, um, liabilities, etc., was so high that the nursery was actually forced to close. Um, and I remember reading the story, and the letter that was sent out to the parents was that, you know, you'll have to make alternative childcare arrangements because we can no longer operate as a business. Now, in this particular scenario, the nursery had outsourced their payroll, so it wasn't even them operating the payroll. Um, so the outsourced payroll provider had fallen foul of the NMW regulations, but it was actually the nursery that ended up closing. So that's also something really important to consider. Um, so the fines, obviously, um, a massive area of concern, but reputation as well is massive. Um, again, I'm talking about NMW. I promise there's more to payroll than NMW, but it is very topical and an area that we see a lot of discussion in. Um, but companies that don't pay NMW can actually be named and shamed. So the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BAES, as I mentioned earlier, um, they are responsible for publishing that information on gov.uk. Now, I'm pretty sure that's every employer's worst nightmare. They don't want to end up on that list um, because it causes untold reputational damage. You know, potential suppliers who are looking to engage with your organisation might think, actually, no, I don't want to engage with an organisation that doesn't pay its staff correctly. Um, you know, people that are considering going to work for the company might see that and think, again, about applying to work there. Um, so there is that reputational damage to be aware of as well. Um, we touched upon this on my first slide, but the errors obviously cause um, employees frustration, stress, all of those things. Um, and it can lead to decreased retention and staff loyalty. So if you're paid incorrectly by a pay, your payroll department more than once, you might think I'm going to the competitors down the road because at least I know they'll pay me correctly. So there is all of those sorts of things that you need to be mindful of. And I know that a lot of research that's been done into payroll errors indicates that, that people are more likely to leave where their pay is incorrect. Um, I haven't included this as a bullet point on the slide, but it is something else to consider. Um, obviously, where there are errors and underpayments, HMRC doesn't get the liabilities it's due, so the tax and NICs. Um, so there's obviously that um, consequence of errors as well. And obviously that money then goes into funding public services. So you quickly see that knock-on effect of payroll. It isn't just payroll in isolation. It impacts almost every area of life. And that's something that, I really want to drive home when I'm talking about how important it is to get payroll um, paid correctly and on time every time. The bottom bullet point as well, tribunals where there are errors, um, employees are more than able to take their employer to tribunal. Um, and this is something that employers don't want to happen. Um, in fact, we're hearing a lot of stories at the moment about employers actually settling outside of the tribunal. Um, so again, this is another big um, area where there are consequences for not processing payroll correctly. So I just thought I'd back up what I'm saying with a few statistics just to illustrate sort of the value of payroll and how much money payroll deals with. So HMRC collected £715.5 billion in taxes in 21-22, which obviously is a massive amount. Um, this was in income tax, capital gains tax and national insurance and that actually made up more than half of annual receipts. Now for payroll purposes we aren't really as interested in capital gains tax but income tax and NI are our bread and butter um, and this just goes to show how much is taken by HMRC and I know we're always looking at the tax gap um, and closing that and um, ensuring payrolls processed correctly forms part of that. 
Um, so I just wanted to show you some figures to show how much payroll actually sends across to HMRC. Um, and then I saw some interesting research from MHR um, on social media, and I was I was shocked to find that 88% of businesses suffered payroll errors in 2022 that resulted in employees not being paid correctly or on time. Now, I know I sound like a broken record with this, but payroll's aim is to pay people accurately and on time. So I'm very shocked that the figures are that high. 88%, nearly 90% um, of businesses have um, not paid their employees on time or accurately. So those employees have had that gut-wrenching moment where they've opened the payslip and it's not correct or they've checked their bank account and the money's not there. This just shows the extent of the problem and why we need to ensure that we're processing payroll correctly. Okay, so I've talked about um, the importance of payroll, what some of the common areas of error are, um, the consequences of those, but now I want to talk about how we can potentially mitigate those risks and I am going to talk now about payroll qualifications. So as we've discussed, payroll isn't straightforward. There are lots of technical elements to consider um, and a lot of legislation and guidance to be aware of. Now, where staff hold payroll qualifications, you can be rest assured that they're well versed in payroll legislation and all of those technical nuances um, that they might not have been aware of if they weren't qualified. Now, as we've said, payroll is often an organisation's largest expenditure. So why wouldn't you want to have qualified people looking after that costs within a business. Um, where employees that work in payroll have those qualifications, you can clearly display this to clients. So for example, on the bottom of your emails, on the footers of your emails, you might have um, designatory letters. Um, so this will give confidence to your clients that their payroll is being processed correctly. And the same applies in-house. So if you have those letters after your name and you're processing payroll for your colleagues, employees, um, then they'll have that confidence that you are processing their payroll correctly. Um, as we spoke about, payroll got that key worker status during the pandemic, um, and that has really put payroll in the spotlight, which is great, but it also means that people are looking more into payroll and um, monitoring it more closely. So this is because of CGRS, and we've had a few high-profile cases where staff haven't been paid correctly. So I'm sure you've seen in the media stories about Asda and Next, um, some of their staff weren't paid correctly. And I know that workers were saying they had to um, go to friends and family to ask to lend money because they couldn't actually make it through the month or the week without that correct payment. Um, and I believe at least one of those cases was where a new system was implemented. Um, so this is just a reminder where you are implementing a new piece of payroll software that needs to be carefully planned out, parallel runs, um, RAM, um, all those sorts of things, it's not an overnight process changing your payroll software. So again, it's really important that payroll is processed correctly um, because there is more of that spotlight on the industry. Now, organisations as a whole, so we've talked about how individuals can ensure they're processing payroll compliantly. Um, organisations more widely can achieve payroll assurance scheme accreditation or PAS as we call it for short. Um, and this demonstrates that their people, payroll and people processes are robust. Um, so when organisation, organisations do get that PAS accreditation, they can actually use a kite mark, um, which again, just shows to clients and other employees if you're processing payroll in-house, that you have dedicated time and resource to looking after your payroll service. Um, and then my final point, um, payroll isn't just an add-on function. So I said at the start, you know, I want to dispel the myth that payroll is a back office function, that payroll just pushes a big red button. And um, that isn't what happens. As we've talked about, it, it's massive, it's so important. Um, and it isn't just confined to the payroll being incorrect, it can have wider implications. So at this point, I'm going to welcome back Justine, um, who can talk about that from an ICAS perspective. I don't, I'm not sure. What, yes, I am on screen again now. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I, uh, yes, in terms of ICAS and payroll um, functions, there's a couple of different considerations from an ICAS point of view. The first being, of course, is that ICAS regulates its members. So um, if we receive 
for example, complaints um, from clients about members. Um, we generally have to investigate those, uh, look into what has actually happened uh, and, uh, and resolve that issue. Um, and some of the outcomes are obviously more serious than others. But first and foremost, what we need to do is make sure that the, the member uh, and any staff that they employ to carry out the services that they provide to the client um, is acting uh, completely reasonably and with absolute knowledge of, of what they're actually doing in terms of service provision. Um, I think it's probably an obvious thing to say, isn't it? But, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily um, employ somebody to provide um, accounting, tax or legal services, for example, who isn't qualified. Uh, so the question remains as to why you would do that, uh, why you would provide a payroll service uh, if you who if you're doing it personally, if you're not qualified or if your staff are not qualified to do it, because payroll is no longer uh, one of these simple things that that you can do like it was in the 1970s when people were paid uh, in cash uh, or perhaps by check and um, you know they were given a brown envelope and and it was all uh, written out on the back and that was their pay slip as well uh, and nowadays there's so 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 many different um, component parts to a, a pay slip and there's so much that goes on in the background. So actually the knowledge that's required is pretty comprehensive. And um, one of the, the, it is an area where uh, ICAST does receive complaints. Um, so I have to be honest about that. The other thing is, you know, would you, would you want to lose an audit client? Would you want to lose a, a tax client because you've made a mistake over, over their payroll? Um, when you're operating a payroll bureau service, it's it's not an ideal situation. It's embarrassing, and it's also obviously Laura pointed out the impact on the actual individuals who who are being paid, but it tarnishes the reputation of the firm. So we really don't want that from an from an ICAS point of view, um, and you don't want to lose clients over it. So. And the other thing um, that's being considered at the moment is professional conduct in relation to taxation. Now, I'm touching on this because there is um, a query at the moment about whether payroll is actually um, a tax service as well. And this is especially the case now that uh, it's possible to payroll benefits in kind rather than you know complete P11Ds and submit them. Uh, to HMRC in that way, which is normally a function of the tax department within a firm of accountants, as we know. But if the function is passed over to the payroll department, then the same queries and the same processes apply, but they're just being done by payroll instead of the tax department. So with that shift in priorities and that shift in, in responsibility, it does beg the question as to whether um, payroll is or should be governed by PCRT. And that is a question that is doing the rounds at the moment. There isn't an answer to that. But I would say that if you were very risk averse, you would probably seek to apply PCRT uh, to that work perhaps because uh, it, it just means that you're, you're acting as responsibly as you possibly can. So that's um, that's a few thoughts from me from an ICAS point of view. Um, I suppose you you agree with that, Laura, um, and uh, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you, Justine. So at this point, um, we were going to look at some further considerations. Um, so a big question that we get asked at the CIPP is what are the key differences between in-house and outsourced payroll? Now, there are a lot of similarities, obviously, because it's still payroll and there are still the legislative requirements, regardless of the environment that you're processing payroll in. But where you have in-house payroll, 
um, this differs to outsource because with outsource you're dealing with external clients um, you could have hundreds of clients, thousands of clients, each of whom will have different requirements and um, probably a different set of terms and conditions. So this is something that really needs to be considered. I mean, we spoke about GDPR earlier and um, this is huge in the outsource space. I mean, it's still obviously very important in the in-house environment, but there's probably a lot more flow of data in and out of the organisation when it's an outsource payroll. Um, with data collection as well, um, it can be more difficult in an outsourced environment because you're relying on a number of different clients to submit that information to you. Um, and whenever we discuss potential policy with HMRC, for example, if they're um, intending to collect more data for payroll, we always say, you know, you need to consider the outsourced space as well. Um, so there was a recent consultation which looked at improving the data that HMRC collects and that information going on RTI. So there was a lot about employee location, more granular detail about employee hours. Um, and when we held think tanks on that, um, people from the outsource background were saying, you know, please, can you take into consideration that we need to go to X, Y and Z clients and get that info? Um, so it could potentially be more difficult for us than in an in-house environment. Um, I don't know if you've got any more on that, Justine. Um, like I said, the, the core activities are the same, but the way that it's it's done is different. Absolutely. Um, I think that in terms of uh, outsourced payroll, the the difficulty, um, as with, with any outsourced function, it's the same if you're doing tax returns, to be perfectly honest with you. The, the, the difficulty there is getting the the right information and getting it on time and so in terms of um i think your your next bullet point was engagement letters so this comment might might actually kind of bleed into that one a little bit but it's it's all about your service level agreement it's about making sure that you have the right um put you know the right stuff in place in your letter of engagement that actually facilitates that information exchange and clearly sets out the responsibilities between the parties as to who is responsible for what and what happens if it all goes wrong because yeah. you know who's to blame um very often there's not enough detail in an engagement letter about payroll and about all the different aspects of it the uh, everything from actually receiving the the information on a timely basis right through to electronic submission uh, and making sure that those returns are correct so you know where does the responsibility lie and who is responsible for it and actually what is the client actually paying for you know sometimes there's a lot of confusion with clients about payroll and Clients often don't see the value in a price per pay slip or a, or a total price for doing the work. But actually, there's a value add in there, isn't there? Because, you know, what you need to sort of point out to clients is the, is the actual, the value that you're actually providing them is the stuff that's going on in the background. It's not what you see at the end of it, which is the pay slip and the payroll report. It's all the work that goes in to actually building that payroll and building those pay slips every month or every week or every fortnight or whatever. And then actually having the knowledge to process that payroll correctly, the, the resources that are needed to do it, the information that's needed to do it, and you know, the, the, the mind, the, the keeping an eye on compliance, keeping an eye on all of that kind of thing and the regulatory aspects of it all. Um, so, you know, payroll isn't an add-on. It's not a bolt-on and it's not a loss leader. Payroll is something that, you know, it, it's a serious service and it should be taken seriously by clients. So it's really important for the engagement letter to actually spell that out. Yeah. and it protects the client so yeah i think as well justine so obviously i spoke about the bays consultation or whichever department that's now going to sit with on the holiday entitlement 
Um, we've held a number of think tanks on that. And I think a big thing that came out of that was this data collection. So getting that information um, on time and accurately, but also where you are in that outsource space, you can advise your clients on what to do, but they can then come back and go against that. So say the 12.07%, for example, the payroll um, function can say, we, we strongly advise that you don't do this, but the client then has the end say. Um, but as with the case with the nursery, where the payroll was outsourced um, and the outsourced payroll provider had obviously processed incorrectly for NMW purposes, it was still the nursery that closed. Um, yeah. So we always need to think about that relationship and the impact. And I think you're 100% right. You've stolen my thunder by going on to the letter engagement section. Um, but things like that need to be considered where, where things do go wrong. And I think when I was looking at this and I looked through my notes, I put leave no stone left unturned when it comes to the letter of engagement. Yeah, because that's right. The more detail that you can put in, the better. There are so many different elements of payroll that we've already spoken about. You can't just have your letter of engagement as a one page document. It needs to go into all that detail. And like you say, it needs to include what the um, outsource provider expects from the client and what the client can expect from the provider as well. Um, I think um, SLAs is a really important one, like you said, um, and just putting as much as possible as you can into that letter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, also just in terms of sort of, uh, you know, payroll provision generally, and, and you've mentioned uh, national minimum wage and and getting it wrong. I mean, one of the the last um, cases that I dealt with um, when I was in practice was um, a care home provider. It was a, a similar situation to your nursery in Solihull, actually, because what happened was there was already a number of care homes in the group. Yeah. And the care home group purchased another care home. And that the, the care home group was a Scottish care home group. But the, uh, the new acquisition was in the north east of England. And unfortunately, uh, because of the, due, the way the due diligence was done and everything else, what transpired was that there was, um, uh, well, the... the uh, the Northeastern um, care home had a, a national minimum wage inspection, uh, fell foul of the rules, absolutely huge arrears and huge penalties. As, as we know, they're very punitive anyway. Um, but actually that affected the entire group and the rest of the group was compliant, but the, 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 the arrears and the penalties and everything else were so enormous that the group you know was on its last legs by the time the national minimum wage compliance people had finished with them and this was really just because of a an inherited legacy uh payroll problem that hadn't been identified during a due diligence situation so it was very very um very very difficult and very sad for everybody concerned not least the residents of the of the care home group so yeah the, there's a lot to consider in terms of uh, of payroll and it it you know it, if there's mergers and acquisitions then obviously the payroll side of things is a, is an extremely important one as well this is what i mean as well justine i mean nobody for a second is saying that though in those scenarios that we've discussed the employer was trying to act unscrupulously they weren't, there was just a, a technical breach of an MW. Yeah. Um, and this is why I get annoyed when people say, oh, payroll's just a back office function. Well, no, it's not, because in these instances, businesses have actually had to close. And we talk about that emotional impact on employees. Imagine the, the, the parents of the children at the nursery, or like you say, the residents at the care homes, they've now got to go and find a, a new nursery or a new care home and it's all those, I always talk about the domino effect in payroll, but it is, that's really important. It isn't just payroll's payroll. It impacts almost every aspect of life. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that's why at the CIPP, we're really keen to raise the profile and to make sure people understand just how important it is to, to get it right first time. And I say get it right first time because, A, once you've made that error, you, you've already, um, you know, dis like broken down the relationship between the employee and the employer. Um, but also the, the, the brute fact is it takes longer to correct a mistake than it does to get it right first time. Um, yeah. I know payroll professionals will say to you, you know, whether have to go back and rework things because there's been an error, that takes much longer than it does just to make sure that things are correct in the first instance. Um, mm. So yeah, really, really passionate about ensuring that payroll is done correctly and on time, um, especially because of the wider impacts that maybe people don't consider um, before looking in a bit deeper. Yeah, and I, and I see um, on the third bullet point on your slide, Laura, you've you've mentioned there about when payroll services are removed or inherited. So yeah. um, I think what, let's talk about when, when they're removed because um, there's, a, there's an issue there from certainly from a, a tax practice uh, or accounting practice point of view. But in your experience, are there problems there? So I think the key thing to be aware of is regardless of where the payroll is being processed, HMRC still expects its deadlines to be met. So just because a payroll is moving from one provider to another, HMRC still expects um, returns to be filed on time and payments to be made. Um, and I think that can be a key issue. The obligations still remain. Um, so whoever is passing over the services or inheriting the services, if they're passing over the services, they need to make sure the information is given to the new payroll provider in a timely fashion. And the same vice versa, where the services are being inherited, they need to make sure that the previous provider has given them the information that they need to meet those deadlines. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think that plays out, you know, very often in, um, in practice because, uh, it's uh, it's often an issue of um you know if the, the sometimes the um the practice decides that they don't want to it, to keep the client and sometimes it's the other way around the client decides to move to another accountant um to get their accountancy and tax services and payroll as well so um where that happens it can be quite difficult where there's an issue around the payment of fees and settling settling the fee, fees and the bills etc so uh, I think you're right because one of the things that happens in that scenario is that payroll can often suffer um, and in the in the handover process uh, deadlines can get missed and and then obviously uh, people don't necessarily get paid and and the the tax and NI might not get paid on time either, which, uh, as you know, causes uh, other kinds of problems as well. So, yeah, that's something definitely to to watch out for, for sure. I think as um, well, Justine, um, yeah. I mean, I keep coming back to this phase consultation, but we really have been living and breathing that at the moment. Um, you know, there's so much more emphasis on data and more data being required um, where payroll services are moved around, um, it's just to be mindful of, of the sheer vast amount of data that the new provider might need um, yeah. in order to process the payroll compliantly. Because I'm here talking about how important it is to get payroll right. We aren't psychic. We need that information that comes in to be correct. And I think that leads back to the letter of engagement question that we spoke about. You need to be yeah. clear to clients what data you require from them in order to do your function as processing the payroll correctly and um, because with the best will in the world you can try and process information correctly but it will be based on data that you've got from the client and um, so again yeah. that's just another reason why the letter of engagement is so important as in what the provider expects from the client in order to process the payroll compliantly it is it, it data is such a massive thing nowadays and data security in particular is yeah absolutely huge and as you said earlier in your presentation um the the the, the data uh, that's held for employees i think 
When I was involved in um, real-time information implementation with the government, probably, I don't know, it might it might actually be about 20 years ago now, so time flies, right? <laughs> but um, uh, when I was involved in all of that, we had uh, lots and lots of discussions about data security because um, at the last count, I think there was about 103 pieces of data per employee that were being collected under the real-time information system. And of course, that's that's never going to go down, is it? It's always going to go up. So, yeah. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the at the Q&A. We've, we've had a, a question in from somebody saying, from your experience, how much do outsourced payroll services, PAS costs per headcount? The so, payroll assurance scheme, I think. Payroll that's... assurance scheme cost um, per headcount. So is it possible to benchmark good services? Um, so I don't actually have access to that information at the moment, but I can definitely go away and look into that for you um, and come back with some information. Um, apologies, I, I don't have that information to hand. No, that's fa that's absolutely fine. We we can put that um, on the Q&A. Um, it's absolutely no problem at all. Um, but I would say, I past, you know, the people that have got the accreditation really value it. Like I say, it's a it's a really good way of proving to clients that you've invested in your payroll processes. And um, like I say, you get that kite mark, and um, which clearly shows that you are as accredit accredited. And um, so yeah, it's definitely something if you're interested, and um, get in touch with us, and we'll have a chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. I know that all the big bureaus have got one. Um, yeah. They uh, they like to make sure that they're their PAS accredited so that they can prove, I suppose it's just another way of adding value to, to you know, the the offering that you that you make for your clients, isn't it? So mm -hmm. um, I can't actually, I can't see any more Q&A at the moment. I don't know if anybody's got any last minute questions they'd like to ask before we close for today, but if not, I think- I was just gonna say, Justine as well, I hope yeah. today has been beneficial. Um, obviously, it's only been very high level and we're just scratching the surface of how important payroll is. I mean, I, I spoke to Justine before this and hopefully there'll be more sort of in-depth sessions on specific areas of payroll. And of course, one of those will be NMW. And apologies, I feel like that's a lot of what I've spoken about today. Um, but yeah, this is just the start, really. Um, and I hope um, this has given an insight into just how important payroll is. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, well, Laura, thank you very much for uh, your talk today. I That's think it's it. been really interesting. And, and obviously, hopefully it does highlight to ICAS members how important it is to, to make sure payroll's right. Yeah. Uh, the, those statistics are absolutely shocking um, yeah. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and they can only improve, really, can't they? But um, yeah. We'll, we'll make the, the, the Q&A document, which only contains one question, will be available um, with the presentation and the slides, etc. cetera. Um, so let me say to you about um, our uh, latest information. You can keep up to date with latest information, guides and resources through ICAST.com for all your tax and general practice areas. You can always continue to access support through the technical help desk, which covers audit and accounting, tax, practice support, AML and ethics. So coming up, we have a range of topics uh, as shown on the slide, including the ICAS president's talk at the University of Edinburgh Business School. That's on the 22nd of March. So you get to meet Indy in person. He's a lovely chap. Um, and... We've got a VAT update on the 30th of March, which should be interesting, bearing in mind it's after the budget as well. On the 11th of April, we've got the spring tax update part one. That's me doing an employment taxes update with the president of the CIOT, Susan Ball, who's also an employment tax practitioner. And uh, on the 18th of April, we've got the spring tax update part two, taxation of owner managed businesses so Chris will do that one for you um, 
so that's that and uh, links to sign up to all the ICAST webinars are available at icast.com forward slash webinars. So it only remains for me to say thank you to Laura for presenting today as well as to everyone behind the scenes and of course to you the audience for watching this webinar. Please do feed back to us on this webinar and let us know if there are any future topics you would like us to cover because we'll gladly do it. So thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.